<coughs> At the beginning of the 19th century, Parisian burial culture underwent a dramatic transformation as new suburban pastoral cemeteries like Père Lachaise displaced unpopular church graveyards throughout the city. Alongside this real shift in location, however, the cemetery came to occupy a crucial new space as a post-revolutionary social imaginary. More than just aesthetically satisfying cities of the dead, cemeteries consistently appeared in contemporary novels, guidebooks, and memoirs as powerful spaces with the unique capacity to repair and restore the Parisian population in the aftermath of revolution. This narrative was not limited to the literary world, as early cemetery patrons eagerly contributed through their practices to the construction of the gravesite as a space that could regenerate Paris by hosting a virtual community of mourners. Before Parisian cemeteries were celebrated as sites for reunion, however, they were pungent reminders of social decay and revolutionary failure. This depot for the dead revolted me, wrote Gaspard de Lamal in his famously scathing 1795 indictment of Paris's municipal mass graves, which he alternately referred to as cesspools and infected holes, exuding a certain cadaverous odor. Physicians and social reformers had been railing against decrepit Parisian cemeteries for decades, but in the immediate aftermath of the terror, traditional complaints about insalubrity mixed with the re reaction and resentment of the Thermidorian period. The National Archives abound with petitions demanding the suppression of neighborhood, quote, pits of putrefaction, which were allegedly killing off local animals with their dangerous miasmas. Many of these petitioners made a point of emphasizing the connection between their wretched cemeteries and the revolution, such as one group I've got up there, um, who concluded their 1796 complaint with a pointed reminder that their cemetery contained a large amount of decapitated victims of the terrorists. Although Paris had been facing a burial crisis for years, throughout the 17, through the second half of the 1790s, virtually every critic attributed the poor state of cemeteries to the experience of revolution. Um, quote, nature, one of our, uh, one former member of the Paris Commune lamented, has been outraged by the indecency of our revolutionary burials. Um, and I just want <coughs> to call your attention to the depiction of a pit of putrefaction over here. You can see <laughs> literally decapitated men being tossed into a hole. So by the end of the 18th century, Parisian cemeteries had become one of the best examples of revolutionary dislocation. Quote, only the genius of destruction remains standing in this bloody ocean that surrounds us. Everything has been turned upside down and mixed together. Mutilated limbs lay everywhere in disgusting tatters, scattered and broken bones. The corpse of a stranger lays next to my father's as though on a battlefield. This was a particularly vivid but typical description of a Parisian cemetery at the end of the century, but its illusion of French society after the terror seems obvious. Similarly, one of the opening lines to a departmental report on the status of Parisian burials in year seven reminded administrators that they were, quote, working to repair the harm and the disorder that is inseparable from such a large revolution. This may initially seem out of place in a report about burial reform, but it illustrates one of the most fascinating aspects of the conversation about Parisian cemeteries at this time. While authors often pointed to these pits of putrefaction as evidence of the revolution's shortcomings, these same spaces also seem to possess one of the secrets to post-revolutionary success. After describing the chaotic, unsanitary, um, and offensive cemeteries that proliferated throughout the capital, authors then laid out often their very ambitious plans for ideal new burial spaces that would do more than honor the dead, they would repair the community of the living. At the turn of the 19th century, cemeteries were thus undeveloped, but valuable real estate in the emerging post-revolutionary city. They were a vivid and horrifying spectacle of revolutionary excess, but one that could very easily be reformed into its opposite. Here then we see the origins of the Parisian cemetery as a remedial social space. If anything can restore man's good mores and social virtues, it is assuredly the view of a coffin and a grave. This is an example of the kind of language that permeated proposals for cemetery reform in the years before Pelachaise opened its gates in 1804. 
there was a consensus among commentators that any new cemetery for the city of Paris should do more than respectfully house the dead. It should regenerate the social morality of the living. Death rituals, explained Arsène Thiebaud, were a surefire way to restore tenderness and sensibility and return morality to all hearts. Referring to the potential didacticism of new cemeteries, he further explained how, quote, at this school, the teacher forms his student, the artist finds his subject, the mother brings her son to correct his vices, and finally, it is where the traveler will calculate the glory of the Republic and the happiness of the French people. The, this last point bears repeating. As reformers weighted Paris's hypothetical future cemeteries with the task of representing the post-revolutionary city to itself as well as to visitors. This emphasized the close relationship that was supposed to exist between cemeteries and patriotism. Quote, a people who is without tombs and without temples will also be without a patrie. The love of one's country is always fused to the religion of tombs. Without this religion, love of one's country would never arise. So even before it was built, people had extremely high expectations for Paris's new model cemetery. It would safely contain and commemorate the dead, help repair the social morality of a population scarred by revolution, and bind the community to each other and to the state. By ascribing this kind of cohesive and transformative power to the cemetery, post-revolutionary writers were tapping into a long history of Parisian lore. <coughs> For 800 years, up until 1785, Paris had been equipped with a large central burial space, the Cemetery of the Innocents. Although it technically only serviced a portion of the city's dead, it was generally understood to be the whole city cemetery. Containing generations of Parisians, this large centrally located burial space was a historically important part of Parisian identity, particularly during times of domestic strife. It had long been more than just a place to bury the dead, functioning at various points as a marketplace, a place for public gatherings, and the site for cohesive acts of popular violence. This particular graveyard was shut down before the beginning of the revolution, but throughout the 1790s, Parisians continued to describe cemeteries as possessing the unique capacity for reunion, even as they condemned their sloppy aesthetic. The cemetery as a site for reunion also appeared in popular fiction at this time. One of the more interesting incarnations of this theme played out in an 1800 novella named after and set in the notorious revolutionary Madeleine Cemetery. There's actually at least three um, novels named after the Madeleine Cemetery around this time period, and I'm referring to the shortest of them, which the entire action takes place in the cemetery. Um, the book begins with a young man, Saint-Julien, returning to Paris from abroad in the midst of the terror. Appalled and saddened by the violence and chaos that transformed the capital in his absence. Throughout the novel, we watch Saint-Julien suffer and seethe with vengeful thoughts as he learns about the guillotine, the death of the royal couple, and the persecution of the Girondins, all the while searching for his father, who, as fortune would have it, lives in a house adjacent to the cemetery. Um, at the conclusion of the story, Saint-Julien reunites <coughs> with his father and also manages to stumble across his long-lost love, Amélie, as she's grieving at her father's grave. When Saint-Julien promises that he will avenge her father's death, Amélie implores him never to speak of vengeance in a cemetery. It is enough that hatred torments life, she tells him. It must not continue beyond the grave. The novel ends shortly thereafter with Saint-Julien's wizened father commending the cemetery as an unexpected but welcome reunion site. Early in the, earlier in the book, the father had explained the cohesive power of mourning to Saint-Julien. When we cry over these August victims, there isn't a family in Paris that doesn't join with us. The anonymous author of this novella echoed the sentiment in the book's introduction when he reminded his readers that the dead didn't cry out for vengeance in blood, but for tears. Now, as sentimental and heavy-handed as the story may be, it does an excellent job illustrating the cemetery as a place for repair and reunion in the post-revolutionary city. So how did all of, all of these hopes and expectations fare once new cemeteries were finally established in Paris? In the spring of 1804, the city opened a cemetery on its eastern border, which soon became known as Père Lachaise. Um, it quickly became a top destination for local and international tourists who flocked to the new space, expecting to be, quote, astonished at the diversity of monuments, the variety of their distribution, the types of gardens that surround them, and the trees that hung over them to provide shade. This description is from one of the many guidebooks to Parisian burial spaces that began to proliferate after Père Lachaise opened its gates. 
these guidebooks are a valuable resource because their authors described, often in painstaking detail, the precise contents of the cemeteries as they existed in the early 19th century. They often included sketches of tombs and transcriptions of thousands of epitaphs that have long since disappeared. However, these books are also fascinating as post-revolutionary texts that not only recorded, but played an active role in constructing the cemetery as an important social space. <coughs> the, the image of the Parisian cemetery that emerges from these guidebooks does resemble the hopeful school for the living that dominated reform proposals in the 1790s. There seems to have been a shared conviction among cemetery tourists, patrons, and observers that grave sites could and should foster moral education, which certainly reflects the earlier portrayal of cemeteries as reconstruction sites. One of the best examples of this, of this line of thought, appears in Antoine Caillot's 1808 descriptive memoirs of his, of his adventures in Paris's four centuries, and I think this is the first of the guidebooks. As he explained his relationship to these macabre spaces, I think and I learn more standing in front of a tomb and reading an epitaph than I would from the most beautiful books in the Imperial Library. Over the course of his narrative, Cayo reflects on a wide range of topics, most of which have to do with the travails of post-revolutionary society. He is particularly concerned about young people who came of age during the revolution. Each time he encounters one of their graves, Cayo laments that the post-revolutionary era is one of, quote, general corruption, owing to the widespread collapse of traditional mort. But of course, the very thing that works Cayo into a tizzy, the sight of young tombs, is also his solution. He suggests several times in his book that if young people would simply visit cemeteries, they would be redirected out of harm's way. Pitching an early 19th century version of Scared Straight, Cayo explains that if he were a minister of education, he would bring all young students to the tomb of one of their peers and announce, if you don't believe my lessons, believe your own eyes. <laughs> this book was one of the first of its kind in, in post-revolutionary Paris, an extended essay that both described the city's burial grounds and offered extensive commentary about them. <laughs> However, within a few years, many similar volumes began to appear. Virtually all of these books perpetuated and expanded the association between cemeteries and reconstruction. But very, very few of them shared Cayo's heavy-handed emphasis on moral regeneration. Instead, they highlighted the cemetery's other key ability, to transform a city of strangers into an emotional community of mourners. The topography of new Parisian cemeteries was essential to this process. As one 1821 guide to Père Lachaise explained it, under the old regime, a instrumental, insurmountable barrier had separated the living from the dead. The revolution had shattered that barrier with its massive upheaval, but reduced Parisian cemeteries to, quote, fields of carnage. Père Lachaise apparently resolved this crisis by providing a haven of pain and regret that united the past with the present and brought the living and the dead together in a, quote, superb city of the dead placed between the limits of both worlds. In this depiction, the cemetery was not only at, at the edge of the city, which was deemed necessary for public hygiene, but straddled the impossible boundary between life and death. This certainly added a macabre allure to Père Lachaise, but it also made it into a privileged site for emotional expression. As François Mulot explained in an award-winning essay about burial rituals, when the living and the dead come together, all the pores of sentiment are opened. This supposedly made individuals in cemeteries particularly receptive to moral lessons, as we've already heard, but it also made these cities of the dead particularly potent fraternal spaces. The authors of these cemetery narratives often demonstrated this phenomenon by recounting, again in great detail, their own strange sentimental adventures among the tombstones. For example, in his two-volume work, Promenade au Cimetière de Paris, Pierre Piatresson de Saint-Aubin described a memorable visit to Montmartre Cemetery during the winter of 1811. As he explained it, he and a few friends were quietly enjoying the somber solitude of a snow-covered cemetery when the sound of a sobbing woman broke through the silence. The group followed the sound to its source and discovered a woman keening in the snow before a tomb, gripped by what they described as the most profound sorrow. The group of friends were, quote, vividly moved by the spectacle, but they kept a clinical distance from their object of fascination. Once the woman left, they scampered up to the tomb to discover the source of her anguish, her dead teenage daughter, Elisa. That's, that's the tombstone. Um, a cemetery worker then informed the group 
that the mother had been visiting the gravesite every second day since her daughter's death. The group was apparently so moved by this devotion that they decided to participate in the woman's grieving experience, and together they composed an elegy for Eliza and inscribed it on two sides of her tombstone, which it is not reflected on that, on that image, unfortunately. Uh, Pietresson claimed that upon returning, returning to spy on the tomb days later, he found the mother weeping, quote, tears of pleasure over her handiwork, over their handiwork. Virtually every published narrative of cemetery visits contains similar stories about an author secretly observing genuine mourners and sharing in their grief. My heart fills with, su with such delicious melancholy at the sight of a widow flooding her husband's grave with tears, recalled one man. However, the same author also noted that one need not limit their empathy to visible mourners. The same melancholy effect could be achieved by simply reading an effectively crafted tombstone, which, if it was done properly, ought to evoke tears from passers-by. Antoine Caillot, who I mentioned earlier, uh, modeled this very behavior for his readers. After contemplating a simple inscription on a woman's tomb, a young woman's tomb, he sat mournfully by the side of the tomb. He remembered everything about her virtuous life, and this is a, a complete stranger to him, um, dropped his head to his chest and began to sob, overwhelmed with sorrow. Um, these descriptions of gravesite behavior, I think, illustrate the ongoing development of the cemetery as a powerful new social space that not only reunited the living with the dead, but fostered the strange network of connections among the living. Although it may seem like melancholy, melancholy writers and tourists were imposing this intimacy on cemetery residents, a closer examination of early 19th century Parisian tombs indicates that this wasn't necessarily always the case. The dead and their surviving family members often invited, and in some cases demanded, a high level of emotional investment from passers-by. One of the most startling things about these gravestones is how they served as monuments not just to the dead, but to the sorrow of the living. For example, one mother covered her, son, her dead son's cenotaph with the details of his life and death, but used most of her exclamation points, and there were exclamation points, when describing her own pain. She described the tomb itself as a tribute of your miserable and inconsolable mother. She recorded her son's final words as, my mother, my poor mother, um, and reminded onlookers that only death would bring an end to her pain. Hundreds of contemporary tombs displayed similar epitaphs promising endless tears and sorrow and expressing fervent wishes for a swift death. As one particularly devoted man explained on this tomb, his friend's tomb, I wait, resign, for the end of my bitter life and an end to my agony. Um, and that was on one of the tombs, and on the other one was also filled with details of his own sort of suffering, um, endless suffering. Um, this pattern is, of course, familiar. Um, Philippe Perriez identified it years ago as evidence of a crucial turning point in attitudes towards death, when the emphasis shifted from one's own death to the death of the other. Similarly, Parisians weren't the only hyperactive mourners in the early 19th century, nor was Père Lachaise the only cemetery that inspired anthologies of epitaphs, although it certainly was the first. However, the Parisian version of this romantic cult of tombs, as it's been called, remains fascinating and significant precisely because of the post-revolutionary context out of which it developed. Um, one final example should help illustrate the relationship between the process I'm describing and the reconstruction of the post-revolutionary city. Jean-Paul Guillaume Viennet wrote his Promenade philosophique au cimetière Père Lachaise in 1824, after years of service in the French army. Viennet's narrative resembles the others I've described, except that his text is saturated with explicit references to the problematic legacy of the revolution, which he refers to as a political volcano, whose eruptions displaced as many men as things. Because of the many revolutionaries who were buried there, visiting Père Lachaise was, for Viennet, a disorienting experience. Walking through its tree-lined alleys was like watching the revolution unfold before his very eyes. Quote, with its good deeds and its crimes, its triumphs and its misfortunes, its heroes and its victims, its beauties and its horrors. When he came across the tomb of Salerier, the Festival of Federation's artistic director, he was pushed to revisit that crucial moment in French history when, as he describes it, the hearts of all the French opened up to hope, only to be disappointed. But despite agonizing over his own conflicted relationship with the revolution, Viennese's visit was not in vain. 
Throughout his strange memoir, he repeatedly comes to the conclusion that he was living in a crucial time, and that he and his peers needed to complete the difficult task of perpetuating the good deeds of the revolution, as he put it, while rejecting its crimes and errors to oblivion. For Viennet and many others like him, the Parisian cemetery could be an ideal host for this rest restorative and expiatory process. In the early 19th century, Parisians imagined and used their cemeteries as critical sites for social repair and reconstruction. In fictions, um, memoirs, guidebooks, and epitaphs, these new cities of the dead became important venues for moral regeneration and social communion. As Jacques-Antoine Doulard, a moderate Republican and one-time member of the directory, noted in 1829, spaces like Père Lachaise completed the, quote, metamorphosis of Paris because they allowed citizens to wholeheartedly celebrate their religious attachment towards family and friends. Such fraternal association was, he concluded, an incontestable sign of the progress of civilization. He may have been overstating his case, but it does seem evident that many Parisians imagined, constructed, and eventually used their new cemeteries as a means to counteract the dislocation of the revolutionary era. Now here are Clement on the papers from Sarah Mazza.